Good morning and welcome to This Week at the Inauguration. The second term. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. As President Obama prepares his inaugural speech. My fellow citizens. What comes next? We're going to have to come up with answers that set politics aside. A new spirit of compromise or more partisan confrontation. They will not collect or ransom in exchange for not crashing the American economy. We examine the challenges ahead with White House strategist David Plouffe and our powerhouse roundtable with ABC's George Will, Matthew Dowd, and Koki Roberts, plus former Michigan Governor Jennifer Granholm for the Democrats and former presidential candidate Rick Santorum for the Republicans. Plus, how will the inaugural set the tone for the second term? We ask the star co-chairing the president's committee. Ava Longoria joins us live. From ABC News, a special edition. This week at the inauguration, reporting from the Museum in Washington, George Stephanopoulos. Hello again and welcome to Inauguration Day. It is in fact today. The Constitution says a president's term ends at noon on January 20th and the official proceedings have already begun. Just moments ago, Vice President Biden took the oath at the Naval Observatory. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor swearing him in. And just before noon, Chief Justice John Roberts will swear in President Obama, a small private ceremony at the White House in advance of tomorrow's public events. About 800,000 expected right there at the National Mall tomorrow, far fewer than turned out four years ago for the first inaugural for President Obama. And everything just about set on the west front of the Capitol where the president will deliver his inaugural address. Our Powerhouse Roundtable standing by to weigh in on what to expect in that speech and the second term. But first, we're happy to welcome back White House Senior Advisor David Pluff to this week. Good to see you, David. Good to see you, George. Thanks for having me. It's, so, so just lay out the vision the president expects to deliver to the nation tomorrow. Well, I think he is going to talk about how our founding principles and values can still guide us in today's modern and changing world. Uh, we do look at this in the State of the Union as a package, so I think in the inaugural, he's going to lay out his vision for a second term. The detailed blueprint and ideas will be uh, in the State of the Union, so I do think you have to view these as a package. He is going to say that our political system does not require us to resolve all of our differences or settle all of our disputes, but it is an absolutely imperative that our leaders try and see common ground when it can and should exist. That's going to be a very important part of the speech. You've been with the president all through this journey and I was struck by something that his biographer David Marinus uh, wrote about the changes he's noticed and others have noticed in President Obama over the four years. David Marinus said that in the second term his will to survive is less likely to contradict his will to do good. He's going to act with more assurance and he's going to show who he really is in a second term. Is, is that what you see? Well, I think one of his great strengths is his authenticity. So he's, he's always been the same person. But I do think that, you know, it's clear. There's a, a huge consensus in the country about how we ought to approach the deficit economy, issues like immigration and gun safety. And I don't think he's going uh, to be very frustrated if Washington is completely divorced from the reality in the country. So he's going to seek common ground. He's going to find every way he can to compromise. But he's going to be pretty clear. And we're also going to bring the American people more into the debate than we did in the first term. What's the biggest difference between the President Obama who took the oath four years ago and the one who will yeah. take the oath tomorrow? Well, there's atmospheric differences. We obviously had an economy that was collapsing all around us. Uh, and he was a first-term president, so at that time he's still putting together his team, his cabinet, and his agenda. I think now the economy's uh, still uh, too weak but recovering, uh, and so the question is right now, it's what building on that as opposed to just simply trying to stem the bleeding. It's a I big difference, and I think the experience of the office, as you know, uh, you know th that helps a lot. And so I think he does have uh, even more uh, sure-footedness in terms of his approach and where he wants to take it. It also country. can become a bit of a burden. You know, historians write about the second-term curse, and I know you and your team have spent a lot of time studying how to avoid that. What's the key? Well, I think, listen, if you look at President Clinton's second term, he made uh, significant progress on balanced budgets. Uh, Ronald Reagan accomplished tax reform. So second term presidents have had uh, Even if success. they're dealing with other problems. Yeah, and you know, we obviously have been uh, fortunate to be uh, scandal free. We want to continue that. So I, but, but if you look, it's not like we're roaming around the, the West Wing looking for things to do. I mean, right now, right in front of Congress and the country, you've got the need to reduce the deficit, continue to grow the economy, energy and climate change, immigration, gun safety. Things are stacked up. And so I think that that uh, 
is going to provide the sort of focus and energy you need. And I think his, his intention is to run through the tape all the way through. Gun safety has jumped to the top of the president's agenda since Newtown. And this week, the president promised to put the weight of his office behind these proposals. But we're already seeing a lot of resistance from Democrats. I want to show some of the reaction this week. Senator Max Baucus, Democrat from Montana. Before passing new laws, we need a thoughtful debate that respects responsible, law-abiding gun owners in Montana instead of one-size-fits-all directors from Washington. Senator Tim Johnson, Democrat of South Dakota. It makes common sense to not have one-size-fits-all. Senator Mark Baggage, Democrat of Alaska. I feel like it's going to be hard for any of these pieces of legislation to pass at this point. These are Democrats. What kind of pressure is President Obama going to bring to bear on them? Well, this is a tough issue, as you know, like a lot of them we're dealing with. I will say this. These are common sense proposals that respect the rights of gun owners. Let's start there. And I think if you look at uh, high capacity magazines, assault weapons, universal background checks, uh, progress you can make on mental health and school safety, all of these things enjoy enormous support of the American people. But uh, Democrats and Republicans. So I think that putting together the legislative coalition is going to be hard, obviously. But we're very confident. I do think things have changed since Newtown. You know, Senator Manchin, for one, other Democrats and Republicans are, are thinking anew about this issue. But, but, but Senator Harry Reid, the Democratic leader in the Senate, and those senators I just mentioned, all signaling that the assault weapons ban is likely not going to get through. And they're likely to vote against it. Will it be a success for the president if indeed the assault weapons ban doesn't pass? Well, I'm not going to you know, predict what may or may not happen legislatively. The president put forward a package. He's taken some actions on his own on things like mental health and background checks. But legislative proposals that he think will protect our kids, help with gun safety. Um, we don't expect it all to pass uh, or in its current form, but we think there's elements of this that are absolutely critical. And I think there's going to be a big spotlight shown on this. Uh, I think the American people are paying a lot of attention to this debate. And he's going to twist the arms of Democrats? Well, we're going to twist the arms of Democrats, Republicans, and we're going to engage the American people in this debate. And at the very least, we need to have votes on all these things in the House and Senate. I'm confident some of the measures you mentioned, uh, CLIPS, universal background checks. I think there are 60 votes in the Senate and 218 in the House that the president would sign. That could be the trade-off. Democratic senators vote against the assault weapons ban, but vote for the magazine clips and for the universal background Well, we checks. think the assault weapons ban is very important. As you know, you were involved in passing this in 94. Uh, and I think that uh, Senator Feinstein's looking at how to improve it uh, and deal with some of the loopholes that were in that legislation. So we, we think all these things deserve votes. We think a lot of them can, can pass. You've also bought a little more time, perhaps now, on mm -hmm. the big fiscal issues, taxes and spendings. The House Republicans signal this week that they would approve a three-month extension of the debt limit without any spending cuts. They simply want to have a restriction on congressional pay. Now, I know the president has said that he didn't want to sign any more short-term exceptions. Will he make an excep exception in this case? Well, we have to see what they're proposing. We haven't seen what they're proposing, and they're going to have to pass it. But, uh, you know, we don't think short-term is the way to go about this. But on the other hand, this is a big departure for them. You know, they were saying the only way they were going to pay the bills they've racked up is to have basically hold the, yeah, I think they have on this principle, and that's very important. So, listen, the, the question is on the big fundamental issue of can we come together on a fiscal package uh, that reduces the deficit in the long term uh, and then helps us grow the economy in the short term? I think the answer is yes. We're doing this in stages as opposed to one big package. So the president likely to accept this if they do indeed pass it. He has said he doesn't want to negotiate over the debt limit. But if they pass this, there's a breathing space. So will he start negotiations right now on the big budget issues after they pass this? Yeah, and we've been very clear. As you know, uh, we made public our uh, offer to Speaker Boehner over a trillion dollars in additional spending cuts, $400 billion in entitlement savings. This is really serious stuff on top of the over trillion dollars we've already signed into law. So uh, the barrier to progress here isn't our position of the president. We've moved more than halfway, which is a fair definition of compromise. And we are going to require some more revenues. John well, Boehner himself said he thought there was $800 billion in revenue from closing loopholes. We've dealt with the tax rate issue. Now it's about loopholes. And I think the country would be well served by tax and entitlement reform because it will help our economy. That's what I'm going to ask you because both the House Speaker John Boehner and the uh, Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, have said the revenue debate is over. Yeah. No more taxes. Are you saying that the president will only sign a budget deal if it includes new revenues? Yes, it's got to be balanced. And by the way, they weren't saying that a matter of weeks ago. Remember, Speaker Boehner said $800 billion in revenue from closing loopholes. What's changed in the last four weeks? Nothing. So there's plenty of loopholes, whether it's people's shipping job overseas who gets preferential tax treatment, uh, the, the subsidies to the energy companies, loopholes for you know billionaires. There are things we can close here to make our tax so system fair. So you're saying fair. no deal if they don't give on taxes? We need balance, George. We need, a, we need spending cuts, entitlement reform, 
uh, and revenue. Have to have that. Let me also talk about immigration. The president has identified immigration reform as another top priority of his second term. You just mentioned it. Again, for the Republican, Senator Marco Rubio has been taking the lead this week. And Jay Carney, the White House press secretary, had some positive words about his proposals this week. But uh, Marco Rubio said this week, and he was on Bill O'Reilly's show, that the president hasn't reached out to him. Take a look. They've never talked with us about it. And the truth is, look, I, uh, the way our republic is designed, the Congress is supposed to pass laws, and the president can decide whether to sign it or but not. But you're a leader. Shouldn't the president be conferring with leaders yeah. in, in the House and the Senate? Well, I'll be more than happy to talk to them and explain my principles to them. But he hasn't called. No, no. Why not? Well, th there's going to be a debate and process over immigration reform. And I think uh, during that process, I think uh, there'll be discussions that we, the president, the administration has with members of Congress and Congress among themselves. But what's clear is this is the stars are aligned for immigration reform. By the way, it needs to be real immigration. Reform, but aren't you going to have to team up with Marco Rubio well, to get it done? My point is, George, th there's going to be a process. And I do think that there's broad Republican support around the country. Uh, not as much in Congress, but maybe we're beginning to see a change there. The stars are aligned uh, for progress here uh, on, you know, building on the border security progress we've made, uh, holding businesses accountable uh, in terms of hiring uh, legal immigrants, in terms of a pathway to earn citizenship. So I do think the, the, the moment is here right now to finally get this done. High skilled workers for our businesses. There's a lot. Those that we are all do. things that he's talking yeah. about as well. Wouldn't it be a more powerful position if the president and a key Republican like that had a united front? Well, George, this process will begin shortly. A, a, another effort here to finally get immigration reform. And at that point, I think you're going to see us working with Democrats and Republicans, people outside of Washington. There's a huge consensus in the business community and the faith community for immigration reform. So, yeah, our hope is that we can do this. Maybe this is an issue that doesn't have to be as hard as it should as it needs to be. It should be something where there seems to be a consensus in the country. I think there's a political necessity for the Republican Party to do this. Uh, and we believe it's the right thing to do for our country and our economy. I know you want to put the weight of the president's campaign behind all these uh, issues. This president of a new organization organizing for action, a new political action committee, unlimited donations from corporations, but the president will disclose yes, all donors? Yes, we will voluntarily disclose all of our donors. And we're very excited. Our, our, the people who actually made the president's campaign in both 08 and 12 are great grassroots volunteers. We're pretty clear after the election they wanted to stay with it. And they want to be out there organizing, uh, driving message, holding people accountable on issues like immigration, uh, you know, the deficit in jobs, gun safety, a lot of passion out there. And so I think one of the lessons from the first term that, that we want to do better is, yes, there has to be an inside game, there also has to be an outside game. It's not either or. And you put those things together because, it, as you know, the times that you really get fundamental progress and change in Washington is where the American people are really focused and pushing. And we want to make sure that we're in communication with them. I know you'll be advising, organizing for action, but this is your last week at the White House. What do you miss most? Well, it's just a privilege, uh, as you know, to work in that building. Uh, and uh, you get a Ph.D. in a short matter of time on every issue facing the country. And it's just a, a, an awesome honor. Uh, to spend a little time there. And I think for me personally, uh, this has been a remarkable journey. Six years ago today, we were the longest of long shots running for president. Now, tomorrow, he'll be giving a second inaugural address. And so I'll miss, you know, this was a great moment where those of us who always wanted to work in a campaign like this with grassroots energy for a candidate like this with amazing colleagues. So it's, it's, it's been a remarkable journey. Uh, but what I'll miss most is just, um, you know, uh, the president each and every day you know, the integrity he brings to decision making, the focus he, he has, the vision he has. Uh, and that's why this second term, I tell you, you know, in my remaining days, you know, he's made it clear uh, there's going to be no let up. He's going to push as hard as he can in a second term to continue to move the country forward, build on this progress. And I think that, as I said, the issues are stacked up. And now we just got to go get them done. So you're going to work hard, but savor that moment tomorrow. Absolutely. David, really soak it so in. Much. Take care.